Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Rethinking Work and a Traditional Retirement. My name is Justin Smith, and joining me today is fellow financial advisor, Will Gunlicks, and also Savant's Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer, Rob Morrison. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, yeah, excited to be here. Um, this is such an interesting topic that's become top of mind for so many people, especially for uh, people in their 50s and 60s. Um, definitely coming out of the wake of the pandemic. Um, this is just, we've been talking about this so much. In fact, actually just this morning had a, had a meeting with clients who were presented with a, uh, a promotion at work, which really got them thinking is, uh, is do I need to take this promotion or can I um, start to think about a, a shift in, in what work looks like? So we're talking about it uh, every day with clients and are excited to go through this today with, with everyone here. Um, the way that we think and feel about work has shifted, uh, definitely, um, and especially as you get closer and closer to that traditional retirement age, reprioritizing how works fit into your life and also putting a bigger focus on your overall well-being, including uh, financial and, and mental as, as well. Some people are being forced into this with layoffs and downsizing, while others are seizing the opportunity to get off the corporate treadmill and start running at their own pace. Some people are realizing that traditional hard stop model of retirement isn't for them. We believe there are a number of ways people arrive at this crossroads, but my impression and our impression is upon arrival, their focus um, starts to shift away from retirement and really towards, am I financially independent? Or one way we like to think of it is work optional at this point for me. Um, so there's really no specific blueprint to follow, which can leave us feeling uncertain and not having the confidence to take the next step. We, we find that so common where people have this thought, but they get paralyzed by that next step in terms of knowing what to do and, and making sure that it's a good, good financial decision for them moving forward. So um, Rob, just curious what struggles and questions are you seeing out there with clients that are at this crossroads? Yeah, thanks, Will, and, and um, really thrilled to be with everybody here today. This is, uh, you know, certainly a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I've been working on this for a number of years. Um, there, there's a bunch of questions, I think, that people bump up into as they approach a, a potential rethinking of retirement. And, and they're, they're very common, you know, around um, how, how does all this fit together? This is sort of non-traditional. We haven't been taught to think about, you know, retirement in this regard. Um, you know, where, how am I gonna, you know, combine my income sources and will, will this be sustainable? Um, you know, I've worked with a number of people over the years at this sort of crossroads and Will and Justin, I know you guys have too. And, I think there's thematically a lot of the same, you know, kinds of questions about how do we solve the financial piece of this. Um, you know, I this I started cluing into this a number of years ago and was so inspired by it. I actually wrote uh, co-wrote a book called Victory Lap Retirement about you know people taking uh, the the road less traveled and and more of a transitional retirement. The thing that I see is that the biggest you know obstacle often is we don't know how to go through this in a process. Uh, we need some guidance, we need some advice um, to kind of get past the fog of uncertainty. Otherwise, we're gonna just turn back to what uh, we know best and what's most familiar. So, you know, my key in this is to guide people through that sort of um, kind of deliberate process, take, take it step by step so you can answer those questions. We, we have lots of wisdom that we've acquired working you know, and we're going to try to share a lot of that today uh, with you. So we're delighted you're going to be with us. Um, we'd love for you to walk away with this, you know, with kind of what your next step is. How could you begin to uh, transition and create more, you know, harmony in your life between uh, work and, and, and your life and pursue things that are more passions and not just uh, paychecks? Um, so, uh, you know, with that, why don't we shift... Uh, to Justin and maybe talk a little bit more about the process. Thanks, Rob. 
yeah, let's let's dig into that. And um, here we like to work to and think of it as just a simple three-part framework that we work through with our clients when they're at this uh, stage in their life. And by design, you're going to see this is a fairly simple process. But if we do things right, we should be able to summarize it all onto a single page. And today we're going to call that your victory lap plan. So as Rob mentioned, we want you to have a takeaway here today of being able to start drafting your victory lap plan and have an actionable next step. And step one, it all starts with your vision. What does your ideal future look like? For instance, what are you doing? With whom? Where is this happening? How are you spending your time? All of these things, you know, the essence of it is to understand and articulate what's really most important to you. And if you do this right, your vision could be as simple as just a sentence or two. This is going to serve as the North Star as you're navigating this path ahead and making critical decisions. And I know, Will, you've got some great examples of client visions that we all commonly see. Yeah, we thought it'd be helpful to go through a few today just to get a sense for some examples, um, not necessarily thinking that these are going to be relevant to you, but just again, to go through some examples for you. So, um, you know, for example, um, maybe your kids have moved out of the house and you want to consider moving to a warmer client climate and uh, pursuing a job where you can work primarily from home. Or an another thing that we've seen that's really popular is just spending maybe a month or two in a warmer climate while still working virtually and maybe you're just you know, renting a place for a month or two, but it gives you that uh, change of pace that you're looking for. So that, that's been a popular one. Um, another one is turning a hobby into a dream job. Um, one example here is uh, you know, maybe becoming the ranger at your favorite golf course, spending time outside, and at the same time, probably making a lot of new friends that share similar hobbies. So that, that's been one that we've seen uh, pretty popular. Um, and finally, uh, another example is getting back to your roots. A lot of clients feel a, a pull to move back to the, to the area where they grew up and to be closer to lifelong friends and family. Um, so now that you know where you want to go, you can start to map out the big pieces that will be required to, to support this vision. Um, things like money, your time, overall relationships, your wellness and work are important. And you can translate those things into goals um, like these. They, these are some general examples we've seen, but it's important to make them specific and personalized for you. Um, for example, how much cash flow do you want out of this transition? How much time do you want to spend working or not working? What impact do you want to have? And uh, where do you want to go at the end of the day? Um, Rob's going to elaborate a little bit more on this as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, probably curious to you. We're several minutes in, and we have yet to talk about much about money or or the numbers. Uh, but the, the point of that is that you need to know where you're going before we can map out the strategy to get there. We need to what, know what you know your ideal vision and what your goals are before we can begin to apply that you know, to your finances. So once you've gone through that, and by the way, I think it's really key in that, that you, that, that's a discussion, that's a dialogue with a significant other and make sure that we're on the same page about what we want life to look like. But once you've done that, you can move into, you know, those critical financial planning, you know, components. So if you're at that crossroads, what we have found consistently is there's really five critical financial components that, that you need to be solving for. There may be some others that come into play, but these are sort of non-negotiables as we've experienced it. The first is cash flow and sustainability. You obviously need to map out and understand your budget and cash flow needs. What are all the sources of income you're going to have from uh, potential work, your portfolio, Social Security, maybe you have a pension, rental property income, um, and you know we need to make sure that that's going to be sustainable. We need it to last not 10 years but 30 to 40 years, you know, for an average two person uh, retirement. So we need to do that. I, ideally you do that with a robust financial planning software to, to test it in all different market and inflationary types of environments. The second big key is, is healthcare. 
Uh, if you're short of age 65, where you'd qualify for Medicare, we need to have a bridge uh, of healthcare coverage. There's three big ways that we see people doing that often. If you're close enough uh, and leaving your employer, COBRA can be that short-term uh, bridge to get you to age 65 and Medicare coverage. Secondly, you know, maybe your spouse is gonna keep working and, and you'd have coverage through your partner. Uh, that's an easy option if you've got it available to you. And lastly, uh, you may have access to or wanna look at ACA policies, um, you know, the private marketplace, or even if there are part-time employment uh, and employers that are offering coverage uh, with which you can work. Uh, Justin, I think, is going to speak about the retirement account and employment benefits. Yeah, and this you know dovetails nicely with healthcare. As you're leaving employment, you know, healthcare was usually provided in that workplace, and there's a lot of other workplace benefits we want to coordinate. Uh, and when you start digging into the details of your retirement accounts and retirement benefits, there's a lot of different moving pieces. There are a number of different age milestones, whether it's age 55, 59 and a half, 62, 65. Um, and there might be vesting schedules for bonuses and incentive compensation. So it's really, really important. What I like to do is kind of sync up a timeline of all those moving pieces. If you're married, you got two timelines to sync up. So it helps to kind of lay that all out on paper, see where all the critical dates and milestones are so you can make smart decisions around that. And at the same time, while Social Security uh, needs to be integrated into that plan as well, because that's going to be a significant source of income when you get to retirement. The next component that we look at is a multi-year tax strategy. A lot of us, uh, a lot of people we see are not thinking about taxes on this multi-year perspective. But as you get into this new stage of life where you have more control over your income, it can be really beneficial to start forecasting your income and tax rates, not just for this current year, but maybe five, 10 years in the future. What we're trying to do in that exercise is identify low points and high points. And it's as simple as finding ways to reduce those high points in terms of taxes and bump up those low points. And if we do things right, we can kind of find a tax equilibrium that'll deliver significant lifetime tax savings. And then the last component uh, that's critical for your financial plan is uh, making sure your investment portfolio is aligned. So if it's not, that can really make or break this entire plan. So what you need to do here is ensure that the mix of stocks, bonds, cash, and other assets that you have in your investment portfolio is going to provide enough expected return to keep up with inflation and the growth you need, but not take too much risk that you might be stretching beyond your own personal comfort level or taking on so much volatility that it could overall jeopardize the overall sustainability of your portfolio over the long term. So it's, it's a very delicate balance you need to seek out on the investment side. So those are the five universal critical components we see to every plan, but it's clearly not a comprehensive list. So Will has a couple additional items that we want to make sure we're reviewing as well. Yeah, thanks. Just as, as Justin mentioned, wanted to throw a few more out there um, in case they're relevant for you. Uh, for example, will you need to get additional education to pursue a near new career path? Uh, maybe you have college funding goals still out there for your kids, grandkids, nieces, or nephews. Um, how can you maximize the impact and tax benefits of your charitable giving during this transition period? Mortgage, that's a, that's a big topic that we talk through. Should you pay off your mortgage? Or should you, is it maybe a good time to refinance it? That's, that's a big one. Um, planning around a potential inheritance. Um, a lot of people, you know, it, it's, it's enough that you wanna be able to uh, plan for that, um, but it's always a little bit unknown. So you just need to work around that. Um, and, and similarly, leaving a financial legacy for your kids, maybe other family members or for certain charities, if that's important, you need to incorporate that in, into long-term planning as well. And finally, do you have any um, life insurance that you should consider keeping, or maybe it's an appropriate time to get new life insurance? So that would be another area to, to start to think about um, in advance. Um, so, so now we've, we've worked through your visions, goals, and action items. 
this is the point where um, you can start to formulate your one page plan. Um, so we brought together an example of what this might look like and, and wanted to go through that uh, with you today. Yeah, so we'll cover some of this as we go uh, you know, here, but you can kind of see how this, this plan you know, lays out from you know, visions, goals, and actions for a, a, a typical scenario uh, and situation, how you might wanna you know, begin to walk yourself through this. Obviously, you know, our experience is sometimes it's much better to have a guide uh, walk you through these steps and help you get to the clarity and confidence, um, you know, so that you can make that choice. Too easy again to maybe put your head down um, and just continue on the path that you're on. But one of the things I would share is when we put together the Victory Lap Retirement Book, you know, the idea is about getting intentional at this point in your life and, and the opportunity to do the things that support your ideal life and your vision and goals and stop doing the things that you have choice. We live a good component of our adult lives out of obligation. And we get to a certain point in our 50s and 60s where you begin to have choice. So going through that process, either you know, on your own uh, or with a, with a coach or an advisor, you know, we think you, you need to take a very methodical approach to it. We'd certainly love to do that. That's part of why we're talking with you here today. We'd invite you to request uh, a Victory Lap planning session. Um, you can do that now in the chat. You're also going to get a post uh, webinar survey and you can choose to connect with, you know, with an advisor uh, after this today and we can help you navigate through this. Um, we're also going to do a deeper dive here in a few minutes and we'll be addressing, you know, questions. Uh, so you're welcome to put questions in the in the Q&A uh, as we go along here. And we'll, we're gonna uh, cover a number of different subjects again, and we'll be happy to tackle those as we, as we go. Um, so, but why don't, why don't we kind of circle back guys into, into our, our subject matters here and talk a little bit in more detail about these, these five key components. So Will, I wanna bring you back in and take a, a little bit more specificity into the cash flow and sustainability piece. Yeah, sure. This is um, first on the list for good reason is this ultimately drives a lot of the outcomes on the testing and, and the plans. And really, we find that um, a lot of people just simply don't budget. So this is important to focus on um, right out of the out of the gates. And you really need to figure out a couple different areas of of the cash flow and budgeting. Um, first, it's good to come up with what are your fixed non-negotiable expenses um, on a monthly or annual basis, and then start to figure out what a discretionary bucket, bucket might look like um, as well. So you're, you're bifurcating those into um, you know, non-negotiable and more discretionary items. Um, and, and some of these expenses change over time. Obviously your mortgage might be paid off at some point into your into your retirement, so that's something you need to address. Um, so once you have these spending needs and wants outlined, um, you can start to see how they match up with your overall financial resources. Um, in addition to any employment earnings, you might have cash flow from pensions. Maybe a spouse has a pension, um, social security. You might have rental income. Um, and, and obviously your portfolio will likely be a big piece of uh, passive income for you. Um, so to feel truly confident in this, you really should use a robust financial projection calculator or, or work with a certified financial planner to plot all these numbers out and test to see if it will work. This will tell you if you are financially independent and if not, you can see what you need to do to get there. Um, I mentioned uh, discretionary, coming up with discretionary uh, budget and expenses. A big one we see all the time is travel. Um, I think it's important to separate that out, especially when, when, uh, when COVID hit a couple of years ago, a lot of retired clients had big travel plans and those um, halted, which ultimately helped them get through that transitionary period because they just weren't simply spending as much, but they understood what the difference was to, in their in their overall um, spending and, and budgeting. So again, important and a great thing to start off with is is the budgeting and cash flow. 
Yeah, Thanks, I, Will. And oh. you mentioned something in there, the, the robust financial planning software. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, if you are interested, obviously, we think working with a financial advisor is probably the best route. But if you want to just do it yourself and kind of use some of those same calculators, uh, let us know in the post webinar survey. We have a tool uh, called MyBlocks, which is part of our Money Guide Pro software that is kind of a self directed, streamlined version that helps you plot out all these different moving pieces. Because uh, when you get to a certain level, there's life's more complicated and uh, you need the. You, an Excel spreadsheet is not going to be able to help you solve for discretionary expenses and the expenses that might end over time and income streams that might come in later. So um, even though there's probably some folks on the call that have a very nice budget Excel spreadsheet, uh, it helps to go to that next level with other software. And Rob, did you have something you wanted to throw in on cash flow? Yeah, yeah I was just thinking about the whole budgeting and cash flow because a lot of successful people frankly, have lived without a budget most of their lives because uh, they haven't needed it. But it, it becomes more important at this stage. And I, in, in my experience as an advisor, you know, one of the, the things that people can miss is the non-regular expenses. For example, weddings. You know, typically you get to this point in life and if you're fortunate, you have children and you're going to be funding weddings. That's not something that you often think about in your budget. You're not doing it every year, most likely. Um, you know, but those major outlays that might happen only one every five or 10 years, they, they could actually impact the sustainability of someone's plan. So it's good to think through, you know, the, the sort of regular uh, every month bills, but also the, the non-regular big trips and, and expenditures like that. So I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, next item, uh, a little more nuance to Justin, if you want to cover back to the healthcare side of things. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And you kind of set this up uh, a couple minutes ago, but it, it warrants a deeper dive because this is really critically important to get health care coverage uh, if you're not yet at age 65. Once you get to 65, it becomes a little bit more simple uh, with Medicare. Uh, it's a little bit more cost effective. But up until that point, the stakes are really high and the coverage is really expensive. So you need to have a good strategy here. Um, and we found that this is actually one of the top stumbling blocks for people to kind of pursue this non-traditional approach. They might be 60 or 62. And, you know, the, the thought of having to go out and solve for health insurance is just so daunting and frankly so expensive that they might stay in a job that they don't particularly care for for another year or two or three just for health care coverage. So we don't want to see this being a, a hurdle to, you know, starting your next best chapter now. So we're gonna walk through a couple of different options. Uh, Rob mentioned before, COBRA is one option that's uh, short-term in nature, but it should be available to you after you separate from service, if you had term insur or group insurance at your employer. That coverage is limited to 18 months though. So it's helpful, but it's only temporary. Um, one way to think about this as well is that you don't necessarily need to make it to 65, if you can make it till 63 and a half, COBRA could be there to bridge you till Medicare. Uh, another good option to think about in the health insurance realm is spousal or partner coverage. So if your spouse is going to continue working and have access to health insurance benefits, that can typically be the kind of no-brainer option for, for healthcare coverage. Um, relatively new within the last 10 years, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare has come into play here. And this has actually become very popular, especially for people who can qualify for the tax subsidies. So what we find is a nice kind of ancillary benefit to this non-traditional approach to retirement is that you have more control over your income. And that means you can potentially minimize income in order to capture uh, the value of these ACA premium tax credits. And it can be a pretty compelling tax subsidy. It can very easily be over $10,000 a year of tax credits uh, for an ACA policy if you qualify. So that, again, can move the needle significantly. Uh, other folks are looking at private market policies, which can be a compelling option as well. But I always encourage people, if you are shopping the ACA or the private marketplace, to go find a professional 
health insurance agent to help you walk through that process. You know, your health is incredibly important. It's very complex and convoluted. You want to make sure you get access to the healthcare providers that you need to in a plan that fits, you know, your personal financial situation as well. The, the beauty of it is typically those agent costs don't have any net impact to you uh, that's already embedded in the premium. So there's really no cost to the consumer to use an agent and having that extra guidance is invaluable. And then one last thing uh, that I know Will has talked about, and I think he's had some actually direct client experience with this, is that you can access a part-time job for health insurance benefits as well. Uh, Will, I think you were telling me about uh, a Starbucks situation, actually. Uh, yeah, I had um, a, a client um, a few years ago who, who simply went to work for Starbucks part-time just for the health insurance benefits. They, they were able to qualify for for full premium coverage. Um, and, and they worked as little as um, 30 days in a three month period. So there's, there's employers out there that will give you full benefits, even though you're working part-time. And when you, when you do the math on the cost, um, in addition to you know, making a little bit of uh, extra income, it's actually a pretty good, pretty good payout rate. So that Starbucks is one that's come up a couple of times uh, uh, that everyone can probably relate to. Especially, if it might be helpful if you have a Starbucks habit and you get an employee discount to boot, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I, my experience has been this is probably the number two thing you know, that keeps people from you know, shifting early is, is what are we going to do about you know, health care if, if we're pre-65? So I, I think it's a critical area to take a look at uh, in, in the order of things. Uh, the third one really, Will, I'm, I'm going to have you talk a little bit more about, you know, we all have, we're working in, in the workforce, you know, some degree of retirement accounts and employee benefits that we need to think about how to, you know, weave into this plan. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. There, there's a lot of potential topics that could be applicable for you within your retirement accounts and employee benefits. So we're, we're going to go through um, a bunch here and they may or may not be applicable, but um, it's good just to understand these. So um, it's, it's important to understand how your retirement accounts and employee benefits obviously work. Um, and, and Justin mentioned this before, there's some critical milestones, ages, investing schedules that you need to be aware of and coordinate into this plan. Um, first big topic is your 401k, you might have a 403b, whatever your retirement plan is through your employer, this is likely going to be one of your largest financial assets. Um, and if you plan to tap into it, it's important to understand the rules around that. So up until age 59 and a half, any distributions from these retirement accounts will be taxable and also subject to an additional 10% early withdrawal penalty. Obviously, you want to avoid IRS penalties if you can. Um, however, there, there's a special provision that allows you to avoid this penalty if you separated from service after age 55 and those dollars remain in the 401k. If you roll those over to your IRA, for example, you could lose that penalty free access. So that's a, that's a big piece just to understand. You don't want to lose out on that potential benefit if you can uh, avoid that. Um, another topic is if you hold company stock in your retirement account through your employer, there could be a substantial tax savings opportunity. And this is kind of a somewhat obscure provision. Um, it's called net unrealized appreciation or NUA. Essentially, it allows a company stock to receive lower capital gains tax treatment versus ordinary income tax treatment. And, and if you're able to take advantage of that, that could mean um, up to a 20% tax savings in certain situations. So that's an important one to, to understand. Uh, once you sell out of that, it's too late. So that, that's a big one. Um, many people also receive some sort of bonus or um, incentive uh, compensation plan. Um, it, it makes sense to, to understand uh, what it's going to take to maximize those bonuses. For example, if you work through 
December 31st, you might be eligible for the full annual bonus, um, even uh, though it might not be paid out till the spring. So that's something just to understand the specific uh, vesting of those bonuses. Um, and the, the same holds true for um, people that have equity compensation, like restricted stock units or RSUs and regular stock options. Um, there's lots of potential planning opportunities around those with vesting schedules. Um, next up is uh, if you have a pension, um, it's critical to review all of the options that you have, whether it be um, vesting through age milestones or maybe a certain number of years of service. Um, that can have a huge impact on, on those benefits. You'll also have to elect how you want to receive these benefits. Um, so you could have just a single life annuity. Uh, you could maybe have a joint life annuity where a spouse or a partner receives a, a portion of that income uh, once you pass away. Um, and, and a lot of pensions are offering a lump sum, a one-time lump sum tax neutral rollover, which often can be a great, great option um, as well. But you just need to review what those look like prior to making those decisions. Um, and finally, we have to mention it. Um, it's not technically a government benefit but you need to incorporate social security into the overall plan and try to maximize your claiming strategy for your specific situation over your lifetime. Um, one example we see a lot that works well is for a married couple, one might claim their social security benefits at their full retirement age, where another one waits until 70 to maximize the benefit um, for them. And the benefit of that is the surviving spouse gets the bigger of the two benefits. So you're really maximizing the benefit for, for whoever lives the longest, uh, regardless of, of who waits until 70. So that, that can often be a nice compromise for people to, um, to claim social security under. Um, and all these often kind of weave into then, how do we, how do we implement a tax strategy uh, over this period of time. And I, Justin's going to dig into some of those um, specifically here as well. Yeah, thanks, Will. And what you just touched on there on Social Security, that's a huge component. And uh, it, it can sometimes be tempting for folks at this juncture to say, hey, I'm looking to leave the workforce early. Social Security at 62 is right there. It seems like kind of an easy decision. But again, it's really important to zoom out to the big picture to see is claiming at 62 in the best interest financially for me and my family. Uh, it could be potentially reducing, permanently reducing spousal survivor benefits. So you want to have that as part of a more coordinated plan. And actually, coincidentally, deferring Social Security is one of the multi-year tax strategies we think about uh, because you can effectively push that income out into the future so that you have less income in your 60s. Uh, and that all weaves into this multi-year strategy. Because up to this point, you haven't had much control over your taxable income. Your W-2 income is what it is. There's no big deductions, you're not really in control. But your tax return can start to look a lot different as you're transitioning to this next phase. You might find yourself with more control about where your income comes from, how much, and when, when it's recognized. So this presents a big opportunity. We actually call this period of time between the end of traditional work and age 72, your strategic tax window, because you have so much more control and therefore opportunities for tax savings. So I mentioned this up front, but what we wanna do on a high level here, is, as we're entering the strategic tax window, is to forecast your income out into the future years, going out five, even 10 years or more. And we want to do this so we can identify the high points and the low points and also find kind of what the, what the equilibrium is. Uh, if a high point might be 35% and a low point might be 12, maybe 22 or 24% is your tax equilibrium. And ultimately what we want to do is find ways to reduce those high tax years and potentially fill up those low tax years. So there's a number of different ways we can go about doing that. One of the most popular ways uh, and impactful ways is to convert your pre-tax IRA dollars into a Roth IRA. Uh, so this is especially 
beneficial if you find yourself in a relatively low marginal tax rate in any given year. And what you're effectively doing is you're opting to pay that low tax now, and then those dollars that are now in a Roth IRA are going to grow tax-free for your lifetime. Any distributions that you maybe need to take later in retirement will not be taxed. And you could even pass that Roth IRA to your heirs, and they could have up to 10 years of tax-free growth as well um, after you're passing. So it's a really impactful tax planning tool, the Roth conversion. There might also be uh, opportunities to trade out of concentrated and highly appreciated positions. Oftentimes this can be company stock or other things that you've held for a really long time and have high level of gains. When you're in this strategic tax window, you might be able to recognize those gains at relatively low capital gains rates of 15% or sometimes even 0%. So that can be a really attractive option. And then I touched on this in the healthcare section, but another really uh, su substantial strategy is capitalizing on those ACA premium tax credits uh, as it relates to your health insurance plan. So those subsidies, like I said, can easily amount to $10,000 or more for a married couple. Now, if you find yourself on the other end of the spectrum, maybe you're still working for the last couple of years, you got a couple of big uh, final payouts and you find yourself in a high tax bracket, there's a different set of strategies you can use. Um, if you are charitably inclined, uh, one of the strategies that I know Will and Rob and I all use uh, quite a bit is funding multiple years worth of charitable giving all at once. And the way we do that is with something called a donor advised fund. So uh, the way it works is that you can look at your goal for charitable funding over five or 10 years. And then again, look to fund that all up front. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that in just a minute. Uh, and then lastly, the if you're still employed, and again, maybe it's your final year or two of employment, you know the, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but you have a couple big payouts coming out. If you have a deferred compensation program, that can be a great way to shift income out of those high tax years and stretch the income out over multiple years that are going to be at a lower level. So Rob, Will, I know you guys work extensively with donor advised funds um, and can extol on the benefits there. Do you want to pick that up and kind of expand upon that? Yeah, I, I was uh, actually going to tie into it anyway. I, I, I'm a huge fan. I, you know, back in the day, um, I, I used to see occasionally if somebody had enough wealth, they'd have a, a family foundation and foundations were uh, complicated and expensive to set up. Um, and required ongoing tax filings. And the donor advised fund is really the sleeker, younger sibling of the, the family foundation, which has been a great vehicle for clients to, you know, if they have a charitable aim, you know, align that with, you know, good tax strategies, where, as you said, we can lump together, you know, several years uh, of giving at once. We can donate uh, appreciated securities and, and what we see increasingly with the current tax rules is people um, you know, lumping some years where they're doing item, itemizing their deductions, you know, and so they plug income and, and, and deductions into one year and, and then other years are taking more of a standard deduction. So I think it's a really great tool and we see adoption going up. Love to talk. If anybody has questions about that or would like to learn more, I think it's a huge area of opportunity for people. Uh, by the way, I, I just want to mention again, um, our Q&A is open. I see lots of great questions, you know, kind of filing in. We're almost done with our comments uh, here and, you know, we'll do our best to get to most of these. And if we don't get to your question today, uh, we'll be sure to follow up. And uh, Justin, as you said, we've got some other great tools and calculators we can, uh, you know, leverage for people if they're curious. Um, if they're interested in a copy of, of our Victory Lab Retirement book um, as well, you know, we, we can offer that up. So the last piece of this, just to, to wrap this up, certainly last but not least, would be the, the investment alignment. So as we, you've gone through these elements and thought about your plan and, and all these potential strategies, you know, we would actually save the portfolio decisions until this point, until the end when you've completed your plan. And at that point, you know effectively what's the overall 
risk level that you should be seeking with your investments. You know, it's always a balancing of risk and, and return. Um, that's, that's about getting the right mix of stocks and bonds in simplest terms um, so that you can hopefully, uh, you know, achieve whatever the expected return for your plan is and, and make sure that's going to be, you know, high enough to not only keep up with inflation, but hopefully exceed it and provide growth over the top of it. Um, you know, and so we're balancing these ideas of, of, of we want growth for the future because we need to offset inflation, but we need, you know, income for today. This is a very different exercise than most of us have, as investors have, have taken on during our accumulation years. During accumulation years, it's just about how much volatility can you withstand. But as we get to your distribution, it's a delicate balance. Uh, and we need the right you know, amount of liquidity to get through volatile markets uh, while not giving away too much you know, return you know, in the long run. I see a lot of people at this stage seeking too much to preserve principle. Maybe they hold too much cash. Think about that in an environment like we have today where you know, we have higher inflation and, and you know, interest rates as low as they are. Um, you might be losing money you know, against inflation in an environment like that. The other thing to think about is you know, the tax buckets in which you hold your investment assets. So that's critical for long-term you know, tax efficiency as well. You may have, and we see most of our clients have money in a pre-tax traditional IRA or 401k type of account. They may have a Roth IRA bucket as well and a taxable uh, bucket that would have joint accounts or trust accounts, things like that. And recognizing that assets themselves have different tax treatment, we need to factor in where we make certain investments. Think about it, stocks, bonds, real estate, even cryptocurrencies actually all have slightly different tax treatments. So where we locate those investments into the right bucket is critical as part of our investment strategy. So a number of things to, to think through there as, as there really is on all five of these areas. So hopefully you've picked up on a couple of ideas. I did see a, a question a moment ago about whether this was gonna be replayed. You are gonna get a link to this. So if we've talked a little too fast in order to get through this, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to replay it um, and go through. But again, I hope, I hope that this gives you some good ideas uh, or areas that you want to focus yourself on, you know, right away. Um, you know, the remaining time we have, Will, I know you've been watching our, our Q&A. Um, what are some of the questions that you're seeing come through? Uh, yeah, thanks. We've got a, a bunch here, so we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I can, I can tackle the first one here. Um, so I plan to use my Roth IRA first to avoid paying taxes early in retirement. Is that what you recommend? Um, typically, no, actually. It, it depends on your overall mix of how much you have in Roth IRAs versus maybe pre-tax IRAs and brokerage investment accounts. If, if the majority of your assets and nest eggs are in a Roth um, vehicle and environment, then that might be appropriate. But typically with the Roth, we, we try to leave those as the last bucket to pull from because the growth on it is tax-free. And so it's tax-free on the way out as well. So it's, it's basically tax-free forever. Um, so we wanna get as much growth out of the Roth IRAs as possible moving forward. And for a lot of, a lot of clients, the Roth IRA is also a great asset to pass wealth onto the next generation in a tax-free tax -free way. So, so that's often one reason why we would um, delay using the Roth um, bucket to pull from. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. Um, okay, so we mentioned, yeah, we mentioned the financial projection calculator um, a couple times. Um, Justin, the question is, what is that? You wanna maybe elaborate a little bit on the Monte Carlo and, and things like that that go into it? Yeah, and I, I kind of touched on this earlier, is once you start adding three, four, five, six, seven different components of your income and expenses together, uh, you need some more sophisticated software because certain expenses change over time, certain expenses go away, you've got inflation, healthcare expenses change over time. So again, we like to use uh, financial planning software. We do have a 
streamlined version that uh, is nice for a DIY type of person. That's called my blocks. Uh, but we always encourage people, if you're at this critical juncture in your life, you should be working with an advisor to really get that expert guidance to, to work through that. Um, I saw a couple other questions here as well. We had a handful all kind of related to health insurance. So there's a couple that I can answer quickly. Um, somebody asked the best way to find a health insurance agent. Um, I would encourage you to, to reach out to one of the Savant advisors um, via the um, survey at the end of this webinar, because we've got advisors across the whole country that have personal experience and relationships with agents. So that'd probably be your best bet. If you did want to do it on your own, I would suggest going on uh, nahu.org. So N A H U. Dot org. That is a listing of, um, and it's filterable by state and coverage needs to find uh, health insurance agents. So I, if I'm looking in a state where I don't typically work with clients and I need to find an agent, that's where I will go is nahu, N-A-H-U dot org. Um, had another quick COBRA question about spousal coverage for 36 months. Yes, there is actually, the typical COBRA is 18 months. Um, so again, you could retire at 63 and a half and that could stretch you to 65. There is a special provision uh, for younger spouses that if the older spouse uh, leaves the workplace upon attaining Medicare eligibility, so essentially that's when they turn 65, the younger spouse could get not just 18 months, but 36 months. So the way to think about this is that if the older spouse is 65 and retires and immediately goes to Medicare, the younger spouse could be as young as 62 and get three years worth of COBRA. So uh, it's, it's a very kind of deep in the weeds, nuance um, provision, but it can be helpful. I've seen that be helpful in some certain situations. And then one last health insurance, one that I'll cover. Uh, somebody asked about living abroad. This has actually become uh, you know, more and more popular over time. And then how do you handle health insurance? This is another great, time to connect with a professional agent who really knows their stuff, who knows maybe where your home base is in the US, and then also what country you plan to spend time in. Because Mexico is going to be different than Canada. And if Florida is your home base versus California is your home base, there's going to be different options. So you're going to want to talk to a really reputable, knowledgeable agent on that front. Um, so that is a quick rapid fire of some of our health care related coverage. Will, what else did you see in there? Uh, yeah, a couple other great questions here, actually quite a few more. Um, can a 401k be converted directly to a Roth IRA? Um, in that case, typically no. How you would want to do that, if you're going from a pre-tax 401k and you want to roll that over to, let's say, your, your you know, financial advisor or wherever your uh, you know, IRAs are held, you would go to your regular IRA first and then convert it from the pre-tax IRA to the Roth. That said, we've noticed that a lot of 401k plans are actually allowing for Roth conversions within the plan now. So you might be able to convert it within the plan to the Roth vehicle and then do a rollover. So that, that could be something that you could look in that would be plan specific for, for your uh, 401k plan. Um, another question here, uh, is it possible to help fund our nieces and nephews college educations and to get any type of tax benefit at that time? That is state specific. Um, Justin, you want to maybe tackle that one? Yeah. Yeah. So a 529 is typically going to be the best mechanism to do that type of education funding for a family member. And that is, again, going to be state specific. Some states will give you a tax credit or tax deduction if you make a contribution into their state's plan. For instance, Illinois will give you a, up to a $1,000 credit for contributions made into their Bright Start savings. Uh, contrast that with Arizona, where I'm at right now. Uh, Arizona lets you make a contribution into any 529 plan. doesn't matter if it's Illinois or Arizona's or California's, uh, you still get a credit. So that's a very state-specific thing you'd want to talk to a savant advisor or a tax advisor about to make sure it applies to your specific scenario. This, this uh, another one came through. This is 
a really common question that we get a lot. Um, so if my portfolio's assumed rate of return is 7%, for example, can't I just withdraw that each year to use for income from the portfolio? Um, Rob, you wanna tackle that one? Sure, um, you can, we just wouldn't advise it. <laughs> and we wouldn't advise it for, for, for two really obvious reasons. You know, one we're dealing with these days, which is inflation. You know, inflation, we have to, you know, factor in that over, a, let's say, an average two-person 30-year retirement, you know, the cost of living is, is going to double at least once during that period. You know, if you think about the headline news these days on gas prices. Um, so we want to, you know, not spend all of the earnings and, and growth every year. We want to reinvest that so that we can, you know, have a rising income uh, over the years and rising earnings. You know, the other factor is that markets do not move in a linear fashion. They do not move in a straight line. So, you know, that we know that there are going to be years where we actually have a negative return from at least some of the portfolio. So we want to save some excess so that we have, you know, cushion for, for those inevitable occasional down years. And therefore we're, we're taking off, let's say you had a 7% return, you know, depending on your age, you know, typically we're going to want to spend somewhere in the ballpark of three to 5% of that uh, every year and then put, put the rest back to work and hope for compounding growth. I would add on that too, um, when, we're, when you're looking at the projections that Justin outlined for tax reasons and also using the projection calculators like a Monte Carlo, often what we'll see is we'll see you might be taking 7% from the portfolio for the first couple of years, maybe before social security kicks in, but then you need to adjust that down as income comes in. So it's not something you set up as soon as you retire and just put it on cruise control. It's something that you want to model out, you know, each year on a custom basis. Um, and, and that's obviously something we can help out with um, there. Um, Another question came in, we talked about this just in terms of something that you should consider, but the question is, should I pay my mortgage off before I retire? Um, Justin, you wanna maybe weigh some of the pros and cons there and for things to, for people to start thinking about there? Yeah, and it, it, it becomes a really complex decision. And again, this is where that planning software comes in handy because you can compare side by side what if I keep paying status quo? What if I pay it off? What if I you know, refinance to a shorter term? You can look side by side to see the big picture impact of all of those. But there's a number of things that come into play. First of all is, you know, what's the interest rate? Is it an attractive interest rate? Um, you know, how is it impacting your cash flow? Is it something uh, you know, that is burdensome or will be burdensome in the next chapter or is it something you can handle? Uh, also, where would the funds come from to pay off that mortgage? Sometimes folks say, hey, I really wanna pay off that mortgage when I retire, I'm gonna take a big distribution out of my IRA or 401k. That's gonna leave you with a huge tax hit and you know, ultimately deplete the growing power of your nest egg. So that can actually backfire against you. And that's one of the things we see when we run that side-by-side -side analysis. Surprisingly enough, what ends up happening is that if your mortgage rate is low enough, and your kind of expected return in the markets is substantially higher by a couple percentage points, it invariably, inevitably, the pay, just stay on the mortgage amortization and let your assets grow tends to win out because again, you're getting a higher rate of return on those invested assets versus paying down the debt. Um, but it can also come down to a matter of, of taste and personal comfort. So there's a lot to weigh there. All right, so I think we've got all of our questions have been answered. We're coming up against the end of the hour. We will watch to see if there's anything else. Um, but as a reminder, there's going to be a survey that's going to pop up in your web browser after this webinar ends. So if you do have any other specific questions that we didn't cover in the Q&A, be sure to put those in the survey. If you want to connect with a Savant advisor to kind of talk further about any of the things we talked about, we'd welcome that conversation and be happy to kind of get you connected to the right person. So just please note that in the survey as well. And in the interim, if you're always looking for more information about Savant and what we do, 
you can always visit our website, savantwealth.com, to learn more. So, Will, did you have any other questions? It doesn't look like it. So, I think that that concludes it. Perfect. Well, thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.